I want to talk a little bit now about what these kids look like and I, in, in real life environments. And I tend to think about these kids as falling into one of three categories. And these categories aren't necessarily static and um, because they can kind of change over time. But one, so I have three different categories. So one of the categories I use to describe these kids is the Mr. Chill. So Mr. Chill, so this child has slow processing speed, maybe perhaps they're even inattentive ADD. They tend to be the kind of child who takes on the persona of being slow. They're just fine with being slow. They wear it as a badge of honor. Don't worry, I'll get it done. Sometimes look like kind of like an old hippie sort of stoner kind of personality. But just like, don't worry. Like, you know, they'll say things like, those kids who get things done on time, they're just noobs. I don't know, is that a term they use down here? OK, because I didn't know if it was one of those bo weird Boston kind of terms. But they tend to just, you know, like they're just, you know, they just get everything done. Like they don't even know what they're doing. Um, they act as though they don't really care, but they actually do. So, and in um, school, they can, school, uh, teachers can actually view them as being kind of, their chillness as kind of being laziness, where I sort of find it as more of a defense mechanism. Like, I know I'm gonna be slow, so I'll just be slow, and I'm fine with being slow. These kids probably have too much of a good thing. Like, we want them to understand their learning profile, but not sort of use it as like, oh, well, I'm just gonna be slow at everything, and too bad, you're just gonna, I'm just gonna be late for class every day, and, I'm cool with it because oftentimes this kind of chillness um, is a, kind of a way of hiding their own anxiety to be honest and speaking of anxiety we have the other group of kids like I said I have three three different categories that I find kids tend to fit with is the mr. anxiety and I, I use mr. instead of Ms. just because like I said most of them are boys so the weak processing speed causes them to be anxious and the anxiety causes them to slow down even further. So um, at home, these are the kinds of kids who tend to have meltdowns, sometimes at school. But they're the kind of kid who, they're really good at school, they know they're slow, they're, they're nervous about everything, but they try and get everything done, but they don't quite get it all done. And they get in the car on the way home and they flip out. So they're perfect all day at school. Their teacher says, no, he's just fine. Yeah, he's a little slow, but he's such a nice little kid. And they get in, into the car, and they're like kicking the seat, and the parents are like, I don't know what happens. He must be miserable at school, but he's not. He's just sitting on this load of anxiety that just comes out when he gets, to, when he gets in the car or when he gets home off the school bus. Um, these are, sometimes these kids have problems at school. We find much more likely to have problems at home, that they tend, their anxiety keeps them sort of behaving in situations where other people are watching them. Um, but every once in a while, these are kids who can have meltdowns at school as well, or in other kinds of residential kind of programs or those sorts of things where they're seeing, you know, they feel like they can let their hair down basically. These kids are really a bad match for teachers who value quickness and perfection. They're just, it's, and sometimes they do, again, they do fine with these kinds of teachers in the classroom, but it ruins them at home. And I'll have parents say, you have to, you have to let them know that they're having trouble at home. And the parents want to do something in their IEP that will help them at home, but it's really, it's hard to make that case because they're not disruptive at school. The last category is this child who I call the lost child. And Oftentimes, these tend to be more girls than boys. Again, this is not hard data. I'm just telling you what I tend to see, at least in this category. These are the, this is the kind of child who's just never at the right place at the right time. They're the one who's, everyone has gone out to the playground and they're kind of still walking around or everybody's on the playground and they're still trying to figure out what game they want to do and the teacher's blowing the whistle that it's time to come back in and they've never kind of figured out what it is they actually wanted to do during recess. Um, they're neither anxious nor are they chill. They're just more oblivious. And sometimes people will incorrectly think that they're just not bright, which is really sad because they just kind of look like they, they don't know what's going on. You test these kids and they, they look really bright. They have these incredible areas of, of intellect, but they just, in, in terms of being able to make choices about what they want to do, they just can't do it at a rate that's quick enough. And teachers who have that time to find the diamond in the rough are really perfect for these kinds of kids. 
Now, I mentioned these sort of three categories, and like I said, they're not, they don't always stay static over the course of development. So you might have a child who in first and second grade is that lost child, they're kind of walking around, the teacher's always saying, come on, you're, and they may develop anxiety because they've always been the lost child. By high school, they may, again, take on, and I'm not even joking, take on the personality of kind of the stoner. They may even be kind of drawn towards and again, I don't have any data on this, but sometimes these kids are kind of drawn towards um, marijuana use. Now you'd think like, that's the worst drug for these kids, but they actually have a lot of anxiety. And so they wind up taking a drug that's, it's not good for anybody, but it's really bad for these kids because what does marijuana do? It slows down your nervous system. So the way that they're using to cope with this kind of issue is just making everything much worse, but and I do find really high rates of reported um, marijuana use in kids with the slower processing speed. Again, it's totally the wrong kind of thing way for these kids to go. So anyway, you, so you might find that, that that might evolve over time. Or you may just find that in high school, this, a child who was first anxious just sort of checks out and becomes the lost kid. So what can be done? Okay, so we know that there are no real treatments. I mentioned this before, no real treatments. There's not a pill we can do that's going to speed somebody up. Medication, though, can help with some of the associated symptoms. So if somebody is taking medication for attention and the attention is working, I mean the medication is working to affect the attention, definitely it's going to speed something up, not in a way that we can actually measure it, for example. We don't give somebody a pill and now they're already all of a sudden faster. But in general, if you're paying attention better, kind of like the question that you, um, was asked before um, about just eating better, better sleep, all of those can help us with some of the associated symptoms which should, uh, can help us go faster. Um, if a child has an associated learning disability, that's a definite. We need to definitely get them plugged into reading better, doing math better, whatever it is. If it's executive function skills, teaching them better skills are better, are, are always going to help. But otherwise, I, we came up with this idea of the three A's of processing speed. So being able to accept, being able to accommodate, and being able to advocate. So when, and they kind of relate to what I was talking about before about resiliency as well. We kind of know that these, even though we don't know how these work exactly with kids with processing speed deficits, we know that being able to accept and being able to know yourself better, being able to advocate your, for yourself better is associated with all kinds of positive outcomes. So we're kind of applying this to this, possibility, to this population. So for example, accepting. So the first step is better understanding the problem. So if you have a kid who you're working with who seems to have this kind of issue, the first thing you need to do is get an evaluation through the school system, through a private evaluator. Um, but some, you need to pinpoint this problem because it's very helpful to see hard data. It's helpful for kids to even say, look at you. You're, like, you are great at reading comprehension. But when we time you, your score goes from the 10th grade level to the 5th grade level. That when we don't give you enough time to finish, we see your scores really decrease. And what does that mean for you? Um, Knowing that it's going to take longer can just make it better. So sometimes the best strategy I have for parents is to just inform them, it's gonna take your child longer to do this. So you just need to back off and know that and help structure them so that they can get it done. Um, and learning to value that aspect of the child's personality is also really important. And then getting a tutor or getting support through the school system that will help them learn strategies, again, that just help them with executive function skills in general. The next A is being able to accommodate. So first you have to accept, this is who I am, this is who my child is, this is who the kid in my classroom is, or in my therapy office is. Um, and then you need to find ways of accommodating. So accommodating is being able to uh, modify the child's environment so that it fits with that child's personality better. Now you can't do that with every single kid in a classroom, but you can do things like give them extra time when they need it, and like I was saying before, help them learn how to effectively use the extra time. So for some kids, extra time is like, I don't want that, I don't need that, I'm always done. Well, yeah, you're done, but you got a 60 on that test because you didn't finish every question. Learning, t teaching them how to use that extra time. And also technology can be useful. Not always, and this is where it's so hard to make generalizations about these kids, is that technology for some kids is a wonderful thing, but for other kids, they just can't learn how to type. 
they just don't know how to do that well, that that kind of motor task is harder for them. I used to um, recommend technology, use of a laptop, use, uh, all of those sorts of things for every kid, because that's what the research was showing. If, you, if any of us type on a typewriter or write longhand, studies show that if you type on a typewriter, you'll write more and you'll write better. Well, that's a study looking at general populations that's not true for every single person. So it's one of those things that you kind of have to look at. And in terms of looking at a child and, and being able to problem solve with them to help them understand, does this help? When does it help? Does it help with this kind of writing? Does it help with all kinds of writing? Those sort of things. And then also, I had mentioned tutoring and developing these compensatory strategies like organization, time management can be very helpful. And again, these things don't happen overnight. They don't happen with six months of tutoring. And I find that sometimes kids in sixth grade benefit from tutoring, and then they get into ninth grade, and the time management skills are so much more. And those things they learned in sixth grade don't always apply. So that's something you have to keep in mind is that it's kind of a constant hurdle with these kids. And then the other thing is to learn how to advocate. And that comes from parents being able to advocate for the child, teachers being advocate, and for eventually the child to be able to advocate for himself. And I'll talk about a little bit of these things. But parents need to understand, OK, my child is like this. I need to accept him for who he is. And I need to be able to say, my child needs more time. My child needs you know, an IEP, a 504 plan, whatever it is. And again, the child needs to learn how to do that. They need to learn, like, wait a minute, like my son does. Wait, mom, do you realize you just told me five things I was supposed to do, and I only got the first two, so you need to slow down. So, so um, I, I have some ideas here then about things that you can do, and I have as a teacher, but really it applies in almost any situation where you're working with kids. So there are more than telling you things that you should do. What I'm providing here are just some questions that you can ask yourself. So am I creating an environment with this child's learning style, where this child's style is valued? Am I valuing this child for who he is? Am I creating a, an environment that maximizes his attentional skills in order to maximize the speed at which he's able to perform? So that's the, um, something else to think about. And are the students given ample opportunities to practice skills so they become more fluent with the task? while minimizing the busy work that can slow the process down. So it sounds like maybe I, I contradicted myself here. So busy work is not good for these kids. However, at the same time, they need practice to become more fluent. So it's hard to find a balance with that, but they need both. They need to not, if, if busy work is being required, it should be in the hope that they are speeding up at certain tasks as opposed to, well, we just need to do 50 of these problems. If it's not going to ultimately lead them to become faster and they already know what they're supposed to do, better to not give them busy work. So more questions to ask yourself. Um, are these, and this is kind of related to what I just said, are the kids given the opportunity to learn skills to the point where they can do something automatically? We're always faster at things that are automatic to us. Is it, are these kind of new skills presented at a rate and amount that allows them time to learn and an amount that gives them enough information yet doesn't overload him or her? Again, this is in the classroom, but it's also if, you know, if you're um, doing therapy with a child, if they're in a group therapy experience, you've got to know, like, okay, am I giving this kid enough time to sort of process this? And I, am I maximizing their processing speed by getting them to think about what they already know about a skill or a topic? And are they given the opportunity to build upon that information in an organized fashion? And you may need to make those connections for them. Like sort of say, okay, now, remember when we were talking about X, Y, or Z? How does this relate to that? Because building those connections, again, is going to somewhat speed up their ability to access that information. What we found is that there are certain teachers that work particularly well with these kids. So they're teachers who, and again, this kind of, we haven't looked at parenting styles yet, but we think that it's probably similar. Willing to learn about the child's unique learning style. So any teacher who said, you know, I'm, I'm willing to learn about what this kid brings to the, the classroom setting. Teachers with good senses of humor, being able to say, you know, laugh things off, not doesn't mean getting the child off the hook, but being able to look at it, okay, you didn't get this done, let's figure out how to do this, but without being too mean and, you know, I don't know, anal. Um, the ability to change the tempo of, in, of the instruction that matches that child, that classroom environment, the ability to not, ex or the tendency to not expect a quick fix. 
And that's really, these kids are, are not even probably going to be fixed. Again, we, if we can't speed up a person's brain, we can't expect them to actually be fixed. Um, like I was mentioning, the ability to de-emphasize busy work and willing to adjust homework so that they learn the concepts, learn them fluently enough without being overloaded. So these are the kinds of kids that if it takes one child, the average child 30 minutes, it may take them an hour to do the same amount of homework. The ability to balance the, the needs of all the students with the specific needs of individual students. The tendency to be excited about technology in their classrooms. So it, to think about technology, like how can we make this work? Or does this work? Or how does this work? And then um, overall, these, the kinds of teachers that are organized but flexible. So not overly organized where they can't change plans and not so flexible that everything's fine. I find sometimes parents are drawn to the teacher who is sort of that laid back, everything goes, everybody's favorite, everybody's favorite teacher in the elementary school. And sometimes those are great teachers. And oftentimes they're great teachers, of course. But sometimes they're great teachers for these kids. But if they're not organized, that tends to actually slow kids down. So even if they're, and sometimes those teachers maybe somewhat like these kids. Um, and can relate to that and change the tempo of their instruction, but other times it's just too disorganized and they don't even know where to start, and they become that lost child that I would talked about before. Um, characteristics of good school environments are these. So um, they tend to be school environments where there's open parent and teacher collaboration, where parents can say, oh my gosh, what happened last night at, at the dinner table or at, during homework time didn't work, and for teachers to be able to collaborate back and forth. A more positive emphasis on individual differences. So school environments where that's kind of acknowledged, um, cherished really, where different learning styles are valued and cherished. An emphasis on the social curriculum. Again, remember these kids have problems with social skills. So in, at school where there's just that social curriculum is part of their overall curriculum, these, tend, these kids tend to do better. Where students' emotional and social needs are valued, not only their academic needs and a school that promotes kindness and tolerance of differences. Um, yes, almost every school says they value these differences, but the school actually has to show it by identifying strengths while supporting disabilities and empowering students. I mean, it's rare to go into a school anymore where something like that isn't on the wall or on a poster somewhere, but it really has to actually be used and done and done consistently across teachers. Hard to do, all of these things are hard to do, but this is what we're shooting for, not necessarily what we can do every single day. Um, other things, schools and classrooms too that are neat and uncluttered as kids tend to respond better when there's less in the environment to process. So, um, you know, it, it, having too much, those classrooms that I love, those classrooms that are just filled with fish and turtles and all kinds of, you know, all kinds of things, gerbils and the whole classrooms are all filled with stuff. Those are great environments for some kids. For these kids, it tends to be a little bit of a sensory overload. You know, when we have like, you know the kinds of classrooms I'm talking about, like just plants and there's a farm in the corner and there's all kinds of, so it's, they, it tends to be in elementary school too much for these kids to process. Again, there are no hard and fast rules, but overall it, it, they tend to do better with kind of clean, uncluttered um, environments. We talked about this before, multiple recess, recess periods during the day to give them um, time to process. So these are the kids who in eighth grade still need to get out and get some sunshine and some fresh air and be able to do that. Almost no kids in middle school, at least in Massachusetts, I don't know what it's like here, get the ability to do that in middle school. I mean, they have cut out almost every recess. And lunchtime is like, run into the lunchroom, 20 minutes, get out. And these are kids who, again, a 20 minute lunch period does not always work for them. They sometimes come home without having eaten because they couldn't make up their mind about what they wanted to get from the cafeteria, literally.